Hello, good evening and welcome to History on Your Doorstep with me, Graham Lovelock Edwards, here on Bro Radio. On tonight's show, we're going to be tackling the origins of something rather odd that tends to happen round about the end of October. We see people daubing fake cobwebs all over their houses, dressing up as Dracula, carving pumpkins and taking sweets from random strangers. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we're going to be exploring the historical roots of this bizarre tradition of Halloween. And quite a lot of the traditions we're going to be looking at, you will discover, are closer to home than you may think. I think it's fair to say that even people with quite a rudimentary knowledge of, of what it's all about uh, realise that it's it's some kind of pagan tradition that has somehow managed to survive. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be exploring what that pagan festival was, what it was all about, and we're also going to be looking at how it has come to survive and possibly answer the question how it's morphed into uh, the bizarre child-friendly incarnation we have today. Because as you're about to discover, its origins were a long way off child-friendly. They were, let's just say, a little bit frenzied. So to help me analyze all of this. Um, a little earlier on today, I went down to uh, Cardiff Castle, which is an appropriate enough place, I suppose, uh, and sat in the castle ground with uh, a chap by the name of Lawrence Main, who, of all things, is a druid. Um, Lawrence, what, what did it originate from? What is Halloween based on? Oh, it is really ancient. So, uh, how can anybody claim to know the, the, the source of it all? But it's, to, it, first of all, to me, as a Druid, it is my new year. Right. Oh, okay. 1st of November is my 1st of January. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed in practice it works like that. If you're going to really start some new project, and uh, I've walked many a pilgrimage for this land, hundreds of miles, and you would think you would start a pilgrimage, say, 1st of April. No. I found a new project has to start 1st of November. Right. Or okay. shortly afterwards. Because, of course, you won't have one old Halloween. You have an old Halloween as well. Yeah, length yeah. of November. Nowadays, you think of remembrance and so forth. Length of, that's yeah. old Halloween. I had 11 days for the um, change in the calendar, which took place in this country, well, in this 18th century. I think the Pope right. started in the 17th century. It took a while to catch on to these strange European customs yeah um hence the reason that you've had the orange men in belfast marching on the 12th of july uh -huh. when the battle of boy of the boyne yeah. was actually fought on the 1st of july right in 1690 oh, you right. see okay. which is good because it means you have a choice to march twice in a year <laughs> so you can have two fights <laughs> and um so uh, there was old christmas as well which was still celebrated today in pembrokeshire and could yeah but um it is to do so a new year yeah a new beginning yeah and new beginnings come after old endings yes and it is the sort of second um harvest festival right you you think of harvest festival perhaps of lunasa yeah uh, to do with uh, lu the, the the god of light yeah um, in the summer, first of August, or Lammas, as they say in, uh, in England, yeah. and um, you get your first fruits and so on there. But then there's sort of the second fruits, the later, the last crops, yeah. and the animals more particularly. They they couldn't come um, when they, people had kept animals. They couldn't keep them all all through the winter. They were expensive to feed, so they would slaughter. Yes. Uh, a lot of them for a big festival yes. at Halloween and they only keep certain selected animals to, to feed through the winter. Right. So it, it was um, a final a final harvest of much slaughtering, I'm afraid, which brings in the topic of death. Yes. Because it's a time of year uh, and I don't know why, it just is. Um, I'm not here to explain, but I have observed and mm -hmm. will observe things that... Um, the veil is thin between the worlds and souls um, are closest to us now and you get lots of ghost stories people are seen at this time of year. Mm -hmm. There are many names for the Celtic festival that uh, Halloween is based on. The most common name is the one of Irish origin, which is Shawain. Shawain being the name of the festival that Lawrence is referring to there. 
But what do we actually know about Charwain? Charwain was uh, a fire festival. It was marked by the burning of bonfires, and it was generally held at the midpoint between the autumn equinox and the summer solstice, a point uh, in the year that marked the end of the months of plentiful sunlight and harvest and the beginning of the dark season. Now, our pagan ancestors believed this to be a tremendously dangerous time of the year. As much as it, it was a new beginning, uh, it was also the end of the old, and that meant that the usual barriers separating the spirit and mortal worlds were very fragile and were breaking down, leaving the living vulnerable to hauntings and possessions and attacks by malevolent demons. Some even heralded this as the likely end point of the world, with only the exact date being up for question. So, for our ancestors, this wasn't really a mild, abstract danger. Sawain marked a, a time of absolute terror, and it called for a mammoth, coordinated effort for us to keep ourselves safe. So, to empower themselves, the ancient Britons uh, used to light these huge bonfires with a blazing wheel, which was a symbol of the sun, maintaining a bright light to beat the shadows back. Then they'd sacrifice bulls and cocks and leave those sacrifices on burial mounds as gifts for their dead ancestors. Because if there was going to be a war with invading ghosts and spirits, then the living uh, ancient Britons wanted to make sure that their own ancestors would be fighting on their side. Now, we will see echoes of this um, in later history, which we will talk about in a moment. Ceremonial things uh, was led by uh, the Druids, people like Lawrence, who would dress up uh, a, a, as various gods dancing around the fire. Gods like Mokus, for example, who I I in, in Welsh was known as Hoch the Gwta. Mokus was always accompanied by a headless woman. We're not altogether sure why, um, but th th their, their role was quite integral uh, to, to the, the whole Shah Wayne uh, festival. Um, probably because it, they just wanted to be scary, I'm guessing. I mean, we, we don't know. We can only speculate. But this ceremony carried on for about three days. Everyone had to participate, unquestionably. Um, even tribes that are at war, there's evidence to suggest, uh, set aside hostilities uh, in order so that nothing could get in the way of, of observing this. Uh, and at the end of the three days, if everyone was alive and not possessed by spirits, uh, then clearly the alliance between the living and the dead had once again been uh, a triumph. Uh, so the next six days were spent in a, in a huge celebration which featured both the living and the dead. So pl places at a feast were set uh, for the dead combatants as well as the living ones. Um, when, when food was being pre uh, prepared, uh, the women folk would chatter into the air to bring the dead up to date with everything that had happened in the last year. Uh, and this was a tremendous outlet of, of joy and celebration. Uh, and this sort of double-handed ritual was, was observed right the way across ancient Britain. We have traces from history of a festival that was observed thousands of years ago. Um, but that doesn't explain how we kind of got to where we are now. It doesn't explain how we moved from uh, a pagan festival, uh, which was all about fighting the evil spirits, to this bizarre connotation we have today. Welcome back. I'm talking to Lawrence Main here in the castle grounds uh, about Sarwain and about some of the uh, the, the origins of, of the festival, which has led to this peculiar Halloween thing we see every year. Um, every area had its own traditions. It wasn't something that was uniform across the whole country, how they observed Charwain. Is that, is that pretty well, much? Um, yes and no. Um, people in the old days were isolated and so you would naturally get to develop their own tradition, like everybody has their own little house. But the no side is actually uh, you could go to the other end of the earth and you'd find a very similar tradition. Right. Okay. It's obviously come from a similar source, and I'm talking uh, globally. Yeah, well, I bet. Well, mo I mean, you did say uh, not long ago about um, uh, November the 1st being the, the, the Day of the Dead in Mexico. And well, it's all you've got All Saints' Day and All Souls' Day uh, and Day of the Dead, all, all coincidentally, well, not coincidentally, it was deliberate. It was uh, Pope Boniface. There is no such thing as a coincidence. No, well, it was all That was said by yeah. that. That great Britain, not Saxon, 
well, a little bit of Saxon there as well, but uh, originally descendant of Cerdic, the Briton, yeah. Alfred the Great. Right, OK. No such thing as a coincidence. Well, when Christianity first came to our shores, uh, they were quite accommodating in, in to a lot of pagan festivals. Uh, and rather than uh, try and stamp them all out, things like Christmas, for example, uh, you know, there's absolutely no precedent for Christmas as a celebration in Scripture. It is a pagan festival that just got rebranded by the church um, just to just to kind of make the whole transition that much more palatable. It was difficult to find a way that the Christians could have rebranded something as frenzied as Charmaine. Um, so initially, there were steps taken to try and stamp it out. Um, which were not successful because it was such a key part of the ancient Britain's uh, calendar um, and also the fact that so many people were absolutely terrified that they were going to be uh, possessed unless they mounted some kind of assault against the spirit world uh, at the end of October, beginning of November. Even though the church did try and stamp it out, it just carried on. So, the church began to look for ways that they could incorporate it. So in the 5th century, Pope Boniface tried the idea of a festival in May, where bonfires would be lit in homage to saints and martyrs. But the idea didn't really assuage the ancient Britons of their fears about what happened in October. So in the 9th century, Pope Gregory moved All Saints Day, which is known in English, Old English as All Hallows Day, to the 1st of November. And this is where we begin to see Halloween. Because the eve of All Hallows Day, All Hallows Eve, is where we get the name Halloween from. Perhaps recognising that Charwain's week plus blowout required a bit more than a single day's replacement, uh, Gregory also created All Souls Day on the 2nd of November. And this is where you start to see the crossover. All Souls Day is traditionally when Christians leave offerings on the graves of dead ancestors. So we start to see some of the pagan DNA slipping into the, the traditions of, of the Christian calendar. Eventually, the idea of lighting a bonfire, which was key to Charwain, fell back to the 5th of November, uh, supposedly to commemorate the foiling of the gunpowder plot. But in reality, All Souls Day, All Saints Day, Bonfire Night, across a, you know, a week-long uh, festival from the end of October to the beginning of November, pretty much retains the essential characteristics of what we know about a Charwain. Because we're talking about things here that happened in prehistory, by definition, that means that there's not much in the way of written records of what actually went on. So most of what we know, we know from traditions that survived it, that continued long after it supposedly should have died out. In the same way that we can look at things like the Mary Lloyd, which happens around about Christmas time, and start to piece together the jigsaw that suggests where its pagan origins were. So do we see the pagan origins of what is modern day Halloween. However, as much as these things show us what was happening globally uh, and, uh, you know, more generically across the known world, there's also evidence of a certain number of things that were very local. So, for example, here in the Vale of Glamorgan, we had quite a few traditions, which you don't generally find elsewhere, that seem to tie in with this festival. So, for example, tied into this notion of the dead rising, there was, up until around the 19th century, a commonly held belief that on the night of Halloween, so more than likely it, it traces back to Charwain, all the drowned of the sea would rise up out of the waters and would rise through the waves on white horses towards the shore. On arrival on the beaches, they would indulge in great revelries, and this is why... Uh, in villages uh, around Nash Point and Mark Cross and Wick and Brufton and places like that, quite often you hear the white breakers in the sea described as merry dancers. It all traces back to this. There is another local tradition linking to a white horse, um, which Lawrence was able to tell me a bit more about. He told me something quite interesting earlier on, which I think ties in 
uh, about uh, Rhiannon. Tell me, who is Rhiannon and what's the oh, story? Oh, Rhiannon there? is my goddess in particular. Right. Because she's the goddess of Khan Ingbi, which is in the land of the Demeter. Therefore, she could be the same goddess of Demeter right. in Greece. Yeah. But anyway, she's the great queen. She's in the Mabinogion. You have Poif um, and Rhiannon. You have the lady on the white horse who wouldn't stop and Poif has to run after. And then she has a a son called Prideri who gets snatched away from her as a baby and taken to the forest and into Gloucestershire. Yeah. Um, that whole story, incidentally, is very interesting because it's in the ancient... Mab- I forget which branch of the Mabinogion. Is it the first branch of the Mabinogion? It's in the Mabinogion. It's in the Mabinogion. In the right, Mabinogion. So we're talking Rihanna. about Rhiannon and how yeah. she rides in a white Bridget's horse. Bridget's a pelican. Yes, and how she... Ogbo. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Right. And, how, and how, uh, how, how that could tie in with the tradition we have Well, much, more, much more, actually. So, but let's Off talk about it. So tell me about Rhiannon and, and Plantwick Major. Well, you probably know more than uh, I do, oh, listener, because I'm not native to your area. I've just passed through it a few times, but I do realise I have heard that there is a tradition of a lady riding on a white horse down to the beach one day in the year. I can't even tell you which day, but it was probably a British Druidical festival, which could well have been what we now call, taking the Irish word, Sarwine. Yeah shall we say 1st November or you could say the 6th or 8th or whatever you want yep. 11th of November would be more appropriate because that was one of the Annons feast days yep. anyway a lady on a white horse riding down to the shore to seashore because oh, this yeah. place yep. slant, what we now called well you could say Slanifted Vale and it's really the goddess's place of power mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right okay well and that would explain why we have that tradition uh, well, you have you, you, you've you told me that they had white horses and yeah. the waves. Yeah. And interestingly, we call waves white horses. We do. And you have now, if you're interested, here's a little bit of rock trivia attached to the uh, subject of discussion here. The Rhiannon that uh, Lawrence is talking about, the goddess Rhiannon, uh, is in fact the Rhiannon in the song of the same name by Fleetwood Mac. I don't like it, Welcome back. You're listening to History in Your Doorstep with me, Graham Lovelock Edwards, here on Bro Radio. We have been talking about the historical origins of uh, Halloween, of the uh, the pagan festivals that it is derived from, some of the the traditions that got left over. What I'd like to touch on now are some of the traditions that we had on our doorstep here in the Vale of Glamorgan that you may not find um, elsewhere in the world. Um, They certainly seem to be very specific to us. Um, And I'm talking about the sort of things. And these are things that maybe some of our more elderly listeners or even their their, their grandparents may remember. Because a lot of these uh, survived right up until the 20th century. For example, there there is a tradition known as the Coil Kerth. Now, what that would involve is um, on Halloween night, writing the names of everybody in the village or everybody in the family onto stones and placing those stones uh, on the on the hearth, the fire hearth, and then going to bed. And in the morning, if any of those stones were missing, then it was a portent that that person would not live out the year. Um, we're a chirpy bunch down here in the Vale, aren't we? We know how to have fun. So what else do we have? There's other, it, because it was a fire festival, you see, there's quite a lot of traditions associated with fires. Uh, so that was one. There's another one, and it, this is a, a, a much simpler one. It was considered lucky to collect ashes from the Halloween fire, uh, obviously once they cooled, uh, and place them in your shoes. And that was believed to bring you good luck. Um, Also, again, I've only heard about this as a Glamorgan tradition. I've not heard about it anywhere else. But it was feared that if you looked into a mirror on Halloween, uh, you might see witches staring back at you. 
Um, so there we go. We got some. We got some truly weird things going on. Um, there's also another tradition. Now this is more broadly South Wales than specifically uh, the Vale of Glamorgan. But there was a traditional coin. A, a tra pardon me. A tradition known as the Cuffelkain Hyph. Um, now this ties in a little bit with what Lawrence was talking about, Rhiannon. Uh, so this was, it, it translates roughly as the harvest mares. It's something broadly similar, if you like, to um, to the Mary Lloyd, uh, which obviously is also a horse. Um, but what this was, was a tradition of making a corn dolly, which, you know, you get corn dollies right the way across ancient Britain. Uh, but th the local variation was it was in the shape of a horse. Um, and this was a tradition around about Halloween. And with it came a tradition um, that uh, there was meant to be a little bit of a play fight between the men and the women of a household. So the men who had made the Cuffelkine Health uh, would be trying to hang it above the hearth. And the job of the women of the house was to try and prevent them with a water fight. Uh, ultimately, however, the men had to be allowed to win. A metaphor for so much in life. Right, sisters? Um, so there we go. So yeah, we, we, we had some peculiarities of our own here in South Wales, uh, as well as the one that I spoke about earlier, about, you know, the merry dancers and, and um, uh, the tradition of the, uh, of the white horse. Um, so that kind of gives you a, a flavour of, of, of local Halloween. You must be wondering, though, there's still some gaps I've left. Where do pumpkins come into all of this? Why is it not so much uh, a festival where we fear evil spirits, more a celebration of things that were scary? Well, we have our American cousins to, to thank for that. Uh, obviously, over the last 300 years, there have been waves of immigration into the United States from one country or another. People from Britain and Ireland, people from mainland Europe, people from former European colonies in you know, African countries and, and South America. And that brought together uh, like a melting pot of cultures. And it gave people an opportunity to see what other cultures did, how they celebrated uh, different occasions. So when it came to things like, well, what the Christians would have called All Saints Day, um, people who had perhaps never seen or heard of the traditions associated with an Irish Sarwain or, or a Welsh equivalent of it, um, they got to see what other people did and pick out the best bits, really. This is what it came down to. So the modern day Halloween has got a hint of the Shah Wayne about it. It's also got a hint of the Day of the Dead about it. Uh, and it's it's kind of blended the two together to give us what we've ended up with today. And the pumpkin thing, I mean, that's, that's a, a Shah Wayne hangover. Um, after... Um, Shah Wayne had become sort of adopted as part of the uh, of the Christian calendar and turned into um, All Hallows Eve. Um, it was still a tradition to burn a bonfire on the farm uh, and to backlight carved um, turnips uh, in the shape of, of of scary faces to scare off evil spirits. Uh, and obviously when Irish immigrants and Welsh immigrants and, you know, people descended from the ancient Britons, when they arrived in the States, one of the things they found was that pumpkins are a lot easier to carve than turnips. Um, so that's kind of how that crept in. And that sort of ties together everything that we've spoken about uh, with regards to the origins of Halloween. And we've learned a lot. We've learned that um, on our own doorstep, uh, we've had traditions of our own, as well as those that are more generically observed across the old Celtic pagan world, um, what the whole thing was in aid of. Uh, we've also heard from Lawrence a theory, and, you know, let's not write it off. There is some possibility that this is right. We do know that when Christians first arrived in Britain, they tended to... Uh, locate themselves in places that were already spiritually significant to the pagans to make the job of converting them that much easier. So if Clantwit Major, as we'd have heard from a previous programme, is where Christianity started in Wales, it follows they'd have chosen that site because it was already a site of 
pagan spiritual significance. So Lawrence's theory that before St. Ilted founded his uh, his institute in, in Llantwit, um, it was in fact uh, a place associated with the Welsh goddess Rhiannon uh, and some of the hangovers that we've got from that, things to do with white horses um, in, in, in traditions, um, they would hark back to that. And the, the fact that um, Ilted's feast day is the 6th of November, which is close enough to all the things that we've been talking about here, um, does lend a bit of credence to that theory that maybe it's right. It was before history, so we don't know. Nothing written down. We can only speculate. Uh, but that's not a bad speculation. So there we are. I think we've learned quite a lot about the history of Halloween. So that brings us to the end of today's program of the October episode for History in Your Doorstep. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if you're looking for further reading on any of the subjects that we've covered, um, so let's start off with Halloween. Um, I myself have written a book recently called More Legends and Folklore from Barry, Bridgend and the Vale, which deals with those areas of history that we don't have a lot of evidence for, where there's a lot of speculation, where there's a lot of uh, kind of guesswork going on, um, including the topics we've discussed tonight, including all about the, the, the Shah Wayne and the, and the sort of pagan origins of what has morphed into Halloween. That's available from all good bookshops, from Amazon, or from my own website at a discounted rate, which is at www.grahamlovelookoutwards.com. That's all from us for now. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe to this channel so you get to see more. Uh, and until the next time we meet, enjoy your history.